incidentally, just about three streets away down the road near Central Station and um, set that up in 2019. Uh, but before that, uh, well, to be honest, way back, I was at Glasgow School of Art doing illustration. There was, well, there still isn't an animation course there, but I studied illustration. Uh, but in my fourth year, I thought, right, I really want to experiment with animation. The tutors were like, great, we don't know anything about animation. <laughs> <laughs> we can't help you, we have no resources. So, you know, so I ended up filming an animation in a cupboard with like a bone camera. <laughs> Uh, but yes, so that's kind of where I am now in terms of like I love making stop motion animations, paper illustrations. Uh, this was photo photographed by the talented photographer Susan. Steve. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'll just start off by showing you my show, quick show the work, and to get a flavour of what I do. <laughs> Ha, <laughs> 
recommend it. I mean, not only does it talk about kind of leashing down, or but it also just talks about the ways that um, you know, if you're not careful, uh, other people can kind of take up your time if you tend to say yes to a lot of things. You find that you don't have a lot of time to just play, to just think of ideas, and, and uh, so one. So it's about kind of like getting your time back, having time to play and like evolve your style a bit. But also um, there's this one diagram, one illustration of it that just really talked to me. And this chapter was about the idea that if you're doing lots of different things, let's say you're working, like applying it to say create a creative job, if you're doing lots of different styles of work, lots of different kinds of work, like I don't know, really you're only ever going to go a certain amount in any direction, like you're pulled in too many directions. So for me, I found this idea that, well, actually, even though I had a certain style of work, I was definitely doing a million different types of work. Um, I think that's kind of not, it's quite common when you first start out, especially as a freelancer, you're just kind of taking anything that comes along, your, your mate's friends, mum's cafe, you know what you can do, and, and I was doing all sorts of mad jobs, but I think it made me realise that if I kept doing that, if I kept letting that happen, then I was never going to really get anywhere, I was never going to really progress, whereas this idea of saying no and just really focusing in on one thing or one or two things, this idea that you could just go so much further if you put your energy in one direction, so kind of to illustrate what that would look like, around the time I read that book, I was doing so many different types of work. I was doing the paper models, I was designing flyers for a cleaning company, I was doing like packaging design, I was an animator and commercials, logos. I was, I was making like enamel pins because at that point, and that's really nice enamel pins <laughs> were all the rage. And I was like, oh, maybe I can make some money. There is no money. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, I have a lot of pounds in my house that I've designed and, and nobody wants them. Um, workshops, and so I looked at it and was like, right, I really can't just be doing all these things. It's too too much, and also I'm not really becoming like a really shit hot flyer designer, am I? I'm also <laughs> doing origami workshops, and well, like I'm not a graphic designer. I was there are terrible logos. <laughs> So I, I looked at them and I thought, right, well, how do I niche down? How do I decide what to do here? And I thought, right, well, um, like, what do I enjoy doing the most? And uh, what makes me the most money? <laughs> and what kind of work do I want to do going forward? So I took, all, so I stripped back a load of things to really just these three things. Mm -hmm. uh, so paper models, animation workshops, paper animation. And I'd probably see that now I've reached down even further and I'm more just doing the paper animation because it's the thing that really brings me the most joy and is like the you know brings me the most money whereas these jobs are nice occasionally but maybe you know so I think it's like even though I did this a long time ago I'm kind of still doing it and still sort of editing and I also think something that's um, like really important, I think, for all designers or everyone who's creative and who's freelancers looking for work or looking for new opportunities, especially if you've got a certain kind of niche style, is like visibility, which I think can be quite a contentious, like a kind of difficult issue because people feel scared about showing up. Uh, you know, visibility can mean many things. It can be like doing a talk like this, or um, like writing an article, or well, for example, this is ways that I've been visible, like you could be doing a silly dance in a video, or, or putting a video on your about page where you just talk about what you do. Uh, for some people, this would be valid for themselves in the eye, like a dirty <laughs> stick, then appear on social media, which is, which is fine, because I think there's a spectrum, you don't have to put yourself out there so much, but you can just, I think visibility is really important, especially online, and I do think the most powerful 
a powerful thing you can do is show your face, even if it's just a one picture of you on your social media or a picture of you on your website. And I think one of the things it does is any potential clients, like, it just helps them find out who you are and um, it builds like layers of trust, maybe. Um, and I think, it, I think we're competing constantly with so much other work out there um, that if you just, you're almost like just reminding people, hey, I'm around so if you need me. Um, it's like a little, little nudge. And, um, I th but I think it is, I don't think it's easy to do. Like, and I think being visible, I would say like, doesn't necessarily just apply to women. I think just being visible for everyone can feel uncomfortable. I think maybe a good example to explain this is like maybe ways that women have been like conditioned to not like be visible. Although I do think it applies to everyone, like, and I think it's like conditioning, especially for us, those of us who grew up in like the nineties, and we had these sort of like magazines, for example, where you're just like women who put yourself out there were just sort of torn down or criticised. I think people worry if they come, if they show up online, then you know it's like some version of like you literally have like things like the circle of shame, where they like just draw a circle around a woman's like body part and be like look at this you know and it's just I think even though you're like yeah but we're not celebrities we're just graphic designers or whatever surely we should worry about it and it's kind of ingrained in you to, to stay small because it means you're safe and no one's gonna you know be nasty about you and like even just it's like totally infiltrated all the parts of culture like for example I think it was like 2016 mm -hmm presidential election and just like looking at the different uh, like media coverage that like Trump got versus Hillary Clinton and people are sort of saying that you know like was it because she's a woman so basically the red indicates how many like negative stories that Clinton got compared to Trump you know and I just think that sometimes people or women are like held a very high like a sort of unachievable standard and I think it's in a way sort of understandable why the idea of just putting your picture on your Instagram can feel a bit scary. Uh, but I think it's like thinking about why, why it's worth doing, like what's the payoff. So I kind of, this feels a little bit vulnerable for me to put this up here, but this is literally a chart I wrote to <laughs> justify to myself why it's, why visibility is important. <laughs> Uh, and for me, it's like, if I'm visible online, then I'm probably more likely to get high value jobs. And I'll sort of go into what I, what I think a high value job is. And that which will bring me financial freedom, you know? So bringing more money, which can also mean, mean that I can like, hire other people or hire freelancers or sort of people to help me. Uh, or and, and that can lead to like the life that I want to lead, which will look like you know being able to travel and have a bit more peace of mind, not worry about money or things, have a bit more time to do the stuff I want to do, have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I thought you know what so okay so high value job, it's not necessarily what everyone might think it is. Like it doesn't necessarily mean like it's a really big job for a bike or something. I think it's defining what a really good job would be for you and for me it's like I created a little like checklist so if a job comes in I kind of look at my mental checklist uh, and for me it's like okay money money matters right is the money good you know are the people nice do I get a good vibe off them um because that's important you might you know the money might pay well but the people are just awful you know <laughs> Uh, you know, paper trails. So, you know, are, is it, um, I think I've learned lots of lessons over the years about having some sort of contract, like a project agreement, having, um, you know, are they willing to, like, agree to my payment terms, 50% up front, 50% at the end, or whatever that looks like to you, uh, having some sort of flexible deadline, you know, that's a kind of, like, would be nice. It's not always possible, but, um, if people are like, it has to be done next week or else, you know, uh, is it something that at the end of the project I'm going to put in my portfolio? So if all these are ticked, then that's like a really good sign for me. It's a big thumbs up. It doesn't need to be a really fancy 
client, but these, you know, sometimes it's more important to work with like nice people and do something that you want to shout about afterwards. <laughs> um, and I think, I don't know if this, the next couple of slides are really applicable, because I don't, I think this is maybe more applicable to people who are just like starting out in their creative careers, like new graduates, but I think when I started out, because my style was quite niche, and I was doing something a bit different, this paper animation stuff. It took me a while to get like work, you know, because it was quite specialised. So it felt like I had a huge boulder <laughs> and it took a while to just push it and get it going, to get rolling in the moss of like one little job, then another little job. And then, and the, but as soon as you get the ball very slowly moving, so in the end, you know, what really was happening was other people in here were maybe getting jobs at big agencies and stuff after graduating and uh, I was uh, <laughs> working part time flipping pizza <laughs> and like animating in my bedroom at night like it didn't so you know I, I worked like part time jobs for quite a while while working freelance till I kind of got things going um, and I think that's something I usually say to like new people just starting out it's like it's okay to do that there's no shame and Sometimes these things take time, like, and you've got time. Um, and something I think that's good if you're really wanting to try out a certain kind of style or develop something is doing a little kind of side projects in your free time, which I know sounds like, you know, does anyone have any free time <laughs> to do this kind of stuff? But my argument is. If you have time to stalk your crush on Instagram, <laughs> you have time to stalk <laughs> some sort of fake <laughs> project. Um, uh, because, and, and also just like this sort of terrifying amount of time that everyone, including me, spends on their phone. Um, you know, a little side project, it doesn't need to be this kind of odyssey. It could just be something you do an hour a week for like two months, and then end of it, you have a piece of work to show. And uh, if you have that piece of work and it's something that you're interested in, then you know, people can see it and they might ask you to do something similar. So in a way you're kind of helping drive the direction of your work in your career. And I'm saving you from this kind of thing, like when stalking something, <laughs> accidentally like a picture of 100 <laughs> <laughs> Are you not supposed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, everyone, I think everyone's done it. And you're just like, <laughs> so if you were doing a side project, you wouldn't have done that. And I think all, also along the same lines, like doing a little like, achievable small side project alongside like, networking. So essentially what we're doing right now, which is meeting people, catching up, meeting new people, forming connections, because it's all about who you know, which I know it can be quite like a negative thing, you know, it's all about who you know, uh, but I think in a way what I've learned is the best thing you need to do is just get out there and know people and, and that will just help a lot of things. Um, so I'm just going to quickly show you a few pieces of work to finish off. So this was a job I did for the RSP. Uh, so when I, I work, I make quite detailed storyboards, so I like to also colour them in, and I'm, I'm, part of that is just so that a client can really visualise exactly what I'm thinking, so that there's no surprises, especially for stop motion animation, like the last thing you want is that I've animated a scene and then they're like, oh, I just really don't like that blue that you've used on that sky, or can we change that one tiny thing, you're like, oh well, I need to reshoot the whole thing. Um, or that whole scene. Um, so this is a little video. I need to show how I made the animation, and then I'll show you the animation.
jobs, it provides the things we need, it connects us to each other, and it gives us comfort and improve our health. We need nature, because Scotland's nature is in crisis, and time is running out. Think about a Scotland where nature and people protect our future. A future where we go to strip nature and give it space to grow, where our most iconic landscapes are restored by the deepest woodlands, meadows, and wetlands teeming with wildlife. But our farmers, because nature provides all the food. But by having the right trees, the right places, our forests are the most excellent money and our wildlife and great jobs. But our close protect jobs go to nature. We have some fantastic places for nature in Scotland. But we need these special places to be bigger, better, more joined up between our wild spaces and our private cities. We must be. Scotland, create a better future for wildlife and people. I think what sort of paper animation or stop motion animation is quite good to really explain our videos. I do quite a lot of them in recent years, and I think it's there's a lot of explainer videos out there, and you really want um, people to engage and watch them right to the end. So I think doing them in a slightly different style, like paper animation, it kind of keeps people engaged because I think as clients, you know, if you're investing money, then you want people, you don't want people to just switch off after 10 seconds, you want them to watch the whole thing, get all the information and get your message across. Um, alongside um, the commercial work, I also do short films predominantly for children. So this film, Paper Gene and Spider, I made in collaboration with uh, Visible Fictions, we're a theatre company based in Glasgow. <coughs> And then um, it's a story about a little girl who's a refugee and she becomes separated from her, her family and goes on a little adventure with a friend with a spider. Mm -hmm. So I'll just show you the trailer. Um, 
key set of this company and its frames, and they also print, like screen print all the t-shirts on the south side of Glasgow, and they courier them around and bikes so that you know brings down the carbon footprint, which is very cool. So they wanted me to create an animation, sort of explain like how they work or the sort of journey. It was all about the button. So I really enjoyed and they and they also already had this lovely illustration by Spencer Wilson, who's a great editorial illustrator. Um, so I, I like the idea of like being inspired by early Pines and Bears got motion series where he's three-dimensional but all the other characters are like 2D cutouts that are standing up. So um, yeah, so the, this was the storyboard from it and it's combining the sort of uh, the buttons and also these cutout illustrations. So I'll just show you what I came up with. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
<laughs> when I was a kid, I was talking about my sister, he's 17 posters, and I started to buy her, she never let me forget. <laughs> so, like, if it was a 50 pound note, I think. And I also see the tears, like, oh, they're made using hair gel. Ah. Yeah, full, full on time show. <laughs> <laughs> so, realizing life, just have a big sandwich for me and get what you want. <laughs> <laughs>
then fold stuff that you get on a wall for sports injuries, and you and you sort of dip this foam in latex, which you can colour with like, different colours of acrylic paint, and then you you sort of like create a little like latex wet latex foam sandwich around your skeleton, <laughs> hand skeleton, and and then you just trim around the hand shape, and then dip it a couple of times in latex and like shade off the excess. And you get these really nice like latex hands, and then you just dust it with a tiny bit of a baby powder so it's not like shiny and sticky. And yeah, the first time I learned how to make hands, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I mean, I, I kind of I, I really like to do some sort of course and show about like making stop motion puppets because it's just really fun and interesting, and and, um, and show other people how to do it. And yeah, that's one one thing. <laughs> And it's really cool. And so it's a detail that you know when it's not done well, you can probably you can probably tell. Yeah. And then when it's done really well, it just becomes kind of part of the world. But um, the other thing I wanted. To, so this is a really I would imagine really time consuming practice. So it's a very it, it takes a lot of time to do. Like you said, just a few seconds of animation. Yeah. How did you figure out how to price your work? Um, you know, that, that's a, I think that's a big challenge for a lot of people <coughs> so when they're starting out or kind of moving into a new niche or something like that. How did you decide how to do that? It is, like, I think any pricing work is always kind of tricky, isn't it? And I, I think, like, I kind of do different steps. Like, this kind of animation, it takes longer because you're making puppets from scratch. But sort of like the paper collage 2D stuff is generally, like, it takes less time like a whole project. It'll take, like, two to three months um, and actually the animation part of it is usually only a few days so I think people like who watch lots of sort of behind the scenes videos for like the Leica films and like Coraline and walls the really nice behind the scenes for like the Arvman walls and all the films those films take a long time and I think a lot of people think oh stop motion animation takes forever but I actually don't think it takes any longer than any other kind of animation maybe take it a little over in the planning stage so everybody's like on the same page but um i think uh, yeah i think like this kind of thing can take a bit longer just because it's like you're telling a story and you have all these different camera angles and everything but pricing i think i'm getting a bit better at pricing but uh, it's it, it's a tricky it's a tricky thing and i think i've, I've learned that i probably wasn't pricing enough so i've been trying to add a profit margin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think that's something that um, comes with uh, experience and like knowing your craft and things. So but, yeah, it's, there's a lot to that. But yeah, is it, it, I'm not sure. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have a whole other session on yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably, it probably deserves its own its own round table, so to speak. So lovely. Any other questions for Eleanor? Yeah. Um, you said you liked Bagpas and Paddington, kind of old school kids. TV shows, animation. Is there anything that's getting made now that's like three D or paper that you think is going to be greater? Well, there's a really cute um, kids show on Milkshake on Channel Five called Two D and Fluff, mm -hmm. and it's like it's all like tactile, made of textiles, and it's this little character, and it's got like a kind of I don't know, like it's a pet sort of bald. <laughs> it's a bit like a puppy and they go on little adventures together. It's, it's kind of hard to explain but it's incredibly charming and lovely and um, yeah, the, there's just, there's a, oh yeah, there's another one I've just discovered called Kiri and Lou. It's a kids show that's been around for a while, it was made in New Zealand and it's all like plasticine on, on sheets of glass so it's got loads of Mm -hmm. And it's one of the guys from Flight the Concords. Oh, oh so yeah. Who <laughs> <laughs> does like the, who, who I think most of it does the voices for it. I'm sold already. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's little dinosaurs and it's like really charming and funny. So it's got a good story and the Luke's kid. It's like the best combination. What's the name of that one again? Kevin and Luke. Yeah. yeah. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. But not really a question but an observation. I love never thought about it but love the idea of moving the world rather than the camera yeah. I, I think we all should just do that yeah. <laughs> well to suit where we are what is the most challenging part of the entire process for you most challenging yeah. um, price of the work <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah i think 
Yes, there's so much that you learn over time, like being working in creative industries that actually is not necessarily related to making the work. It's like how you get find new work and, and working with people and, and finding great clients and building relationships with those clients and all those sort of things. I, I've never worked in an agency, so sometimes I just feel like kind of making it up as I go along. But then I think everyone is. So. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's just like learning all like that there's so much more to it than just the work. It's actually like the relationships you make and the people that you meet and um, and, and and putting yourself out there and getting people to know yeah, showing people your work and finding ways to do that. It's you can do it on a semi consistent basis because I think this idea that everyone has to be like super consistent and post all the time is like not really we're human, like so sometimes you're just not feeling it and sometimes you're in the mood. So um, I think just learning that no one's perfect and um, can I think we're all quite hard on ourselves as creatives and, and especially when you look around and you're like, oh that person's killing it right now and why am I killing it? <laughs> um, so yeah, I think these are the kind of things that are difficult but for you know you learn over time. Lovely. Well, I think we'll step there because uh, we are out of time. But thank you very much, Alan.